Today we're in the heart of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and we're interviewing the uh, the owner of Renfield Productions, and he's also appeared in and produced and directed numerous uh, documentaries, television shows, uh, short and feature films, including Gremlins 1, Gremlins 2, uh, Piranha, and The Howling, which is probably one of my favorite uh, horror films of all time. Uh, Mr. Joe Dante, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Madison's been treating you pretty well so far? Yeah, I like Madison. Madison is a fun town. It's a college town. It's uh, Politically, I'm on the same page as, <laughs> as everybody but the governor. And, um, you know, everybody's been great to me. Excellent. So, in 1974, you were working with uh, Roger Corman, working for Roger Corman. Mm -hmm. And you were working in sales, and then you went into editing trailers for him. Um, how was it like working with Roger Corman? Well, if it wasn't for Corman, I wouldn't be here. Uh, that was a, a sort of a golden era in um, uh, in Hollywood, where people who were not in the union and had just come out from Topeka or wherever uh, had a place that they could go and actually get to work on real movies uh, without having to go th jump through hoops or go up the ladder. You know, if I had been, I started as an editor. If I had stayed an editor, I probably wouldn't have directed my first movie for five or ten years. Now, when you were editing the trailers, I think you mentioned one time there was a certain. Uh, clip that you used in a few of the different trailers? Well, the trailers of Corman's were uh, generally for movies that weren't exactly top quality, and uh, one of the things that we used to do is we used to have to fake things. Sometimes the movies weren't very exciting on their own, so at one point we found this exploding helicopter from um, a Filipino movie, and uh, we discovered that it looked just as good in a trailer for somebody else's movie. So if we had a picture that uh, you know didn't have a lot of action in it, uh, we'd just make sure that we cut in with the exploding helicopter wherever we could and, and uh, usually by the time people uh, saw the movie they'd forgotten that they'd seen the trailer and <laughs> didn't notice there was no exploding helicopter. Nice. Um, now after you worked for Roger, uh, it was 1976, you made your directorial debut with Hollywood Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Now how did you land that job? Well Alan Arkish and I were the trailer department and John Davison who produced Airplane and Starship Troopers was the head of advertising and at the time we were, you know, we were contemplating the idea of what it would be like to make a movie. But Roger didn't want to lose us from the trailer department because the movies were making money and we were the trailers were, were working. So uh, he said we could make a picture, but it had to be the cheapest picture that had been made uh, at New World Pictures, which was cheap indeed. Uh, and at night we had to make the trailers. So we had to keep, you know, we couldn't there was couldn't be any stop in the uh, supply of trailers. So we figured there was no way for that kind of money we were going to make a movie that you could release. Uh, unless we used action footage from other pictures that we had been making trailers for. So we uh, concocted a story about uh, a movie company making movies um, that used footage from all these other pictures. And we had a, a lot of jungle movies, so they were making a jungle movie. There were some uh, 20s gangster movies, so we, we used some footage from them. And it, all, it was all about our actors, putting our actors in the clothes of the people in the shots and uh, using that for the action scenes. Nice. Um, what was it like? Uh, working as a director on the set of that film, uh, being your first time as a director, and it was shot in like 10 days. It was such a short time span to be able to Well, it was 10 days, but it was two directors. So what would happen is I would set up a shot and, and start shooting, and while I was shooting my shot, Alan would be on the other side of the hill or the other side of the room setting up his own shot. And then when I called cut, he would call action. And then while he was shooting his scene, I would set up my scene. So we actually got a lot done. Considering the fact it was a ten days ten day movie, we probably got about eighteen days worth of shots out of it. So not a whole lot of stress there. No, it was a tremendous amount of stress <laughs> uh, because we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, this the great thing about working at Corman's was that you got to learn on the job, and you figured out, oh, that doesn't work. I won't do that again, uh, and that, that went right back into the editor department. When we started to edit. You just realized, well, you can't do that again because this doesn't cut with this. Uh, and so you you did learn a lot of things not to do, so that next time you got a job, you were a little bit ahead of the game. Of, of people who hadn't done it before. Excellent. So it was 1976, and then in 1978 you did Piranha. Mm -hmm. Now that was recently uh, remade and released in 3D. What's your take on um, all the remakes of the films and the 3D craze? That well, there's happened? always been there's always been 3D since the 50s, uh, even earlier, and there have always been remakes. Uh, the Wizard of Oz is a remake. The Maltese Falcon is a remake. I mean, a lot of our favorite movies are remakes, but. Um, it's really out of hand right now. I mean, basically, you've got a lot of people running the studios who don't really, uh, uh, they don't know what to make and they don't know what to, who, who to make it for. They don't know what the delivery systems are going to be. Uh, they're, they're all a little panicked. And so they figure that they can go into the library and find a title that they think people remember. 
it's, they'll probably have a leg up if they make a picture out of it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it works, frequently it doesn't. Yeah. Um, one of your more recent films, The Hole, which won a, an award at the Venice Film Festival, um, that was in 3D. That was real 3D. That wasn't fake 3D. Okay. You know, a lot they, of these movies are in fake 3D. They just shoot them flat and then they convert them into computer. Uh, it doesn't look as good. Um, are there any different challenges between uh, shooting 3D and uh, 2D? Yeah, it's different. That's why you have to shoot the picture in 3D. It's you stage it differently, you cut it differently. It's uh, it's a it's a it's a different regimen, and uh, the uh, audience's discomfort. I mean, um, uh, there can be a lot of eye discomfort if the 3D is done badly, and and uh, and frankly, uh, if it's also it's, if it's badly projected, which most 3D is, or if it's too dim, which most of the conversions are. Um, it can turn people off. And I, I've gone to the multiplexes where people say, which theater is running the 3D version? And they say, this one's running. And I want the 2D version. Because they've had it, you know, and also, let's face it, I mean, the studios have greedily upped the ante by charging more money for 3D movies and uh, to an audience segment that doesn't have a lot of money right now. And on, uh, a lot of young people that I know just say, look, I just don't see the 3D movie because I just can't afford it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, The Howling had some of the best special effects, I personally think. That I've ever seen. Uh, what was it like working with the special effects crew on that film? Well, Rob Bottin was the special effects mm-hmm. crew, and he was, uh, a, a, frankly, a, a genius so who I had worked with on Piranha. Uh, was a protege of Rick Baker, who was at one time going to do The Howling. Uh, and Rob uh, was handed the whole thing when Rick went off to do John Landis's movie, and um, basically just came through with flying colors. Uh, Rob is a perfectionist, and um, he. So there, there was one day that went by that we didn't get any shots at all because he was being a perfectionist. Uh, but when it was all done, um, it, the, the effects were groundbreaking, and uh, the movie was a big hit. Uh, and it's it started his career, started it, and it really jump started my career. Now, how did you get introduced to uh, Steven Spielberg and get into working with him? Well, he kind of introduced himself. He sent me the script for Gremlins after I had done The Howling. Uh, and he had seen both Piranha and The Howling. And in fact, had hired uh, Dee Wallace, the star of The Howling, to be the mom of E.T. And uh, so I got this script, and I figured it must have surely come to the wrong address, because how could this guy know who I was? I was just... When you made movies for, for Corman, and you made pictures like The Howling, which were, you know, low-budget, non-union movies, you really didn't think anybody was noticing. I mean, you didn't really feel like you were playing in the same league as the people who worked for the studios. So it was sort of surprising to find out that he actually did intend us, intend me to read the script. And at that time, of course, he wanted to make a low-budget horror film uh, out of Gremlins. And... Um, we proceeded to try to do just that, and it became apparent that it was going to cost a little bit more money to have these things running around biting people's ankles. And, and so we went to Warner Brothers, and, and we made a deal, and, and it became a studio movie. All right. Now, you've worked with a lot of actors, from young actors like uh, Corey Feldman uh, to Tom Hanks. Um, how did you come about meeting Dick Miller and casting him in, in most of your movies? Well, I was a big fan of Roger Corman's movies, and I had seen Dick in a lot of pictures, and I always liked him. I always thought he was one of my favorite actors, and so when I got a chance to come out here and actually, you know, make a movie, it was I thought, well, this is this is great. This is a chance. I'll, have a, I'll write a part for Dick. And so Dick played a sleazy agent in Hollywood Boulevard that was an, an agent named after a character he played in an earlier Corman picture. And uh, we hit it off, and he was he, he was a great guy. We became friends, and then every time I would have a movie, I would always look for a part for Dick. And it's it's uh, it's it, it's gone pretty much nonstop since then. <laughs> yeah, he's a great actor. You can see him everything. It seems he's like. in he's in some James Cameron movies and some Robert Aldrich movies. He has a lot of movies. Now your career has been uh, over thirty years now, and you've done horror, drama, uh, suspense, comedy. A- animation. Is there any one specific genre that you prefer uh, directing more than any of the others? Not really. I like to. I like to work. I like to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've done a lot of TV shows too. Yeah. Got Twilight Zone, um, Erie. Is that Erie? Pen- Erie, Indiana. Erie, Indiana. Not Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie, yep. Indiana. A sadly unknown, uh, but very, I thought, terrific show that kids would love if they knew it existed. Yeah. What are the differences between shooting a feature film and shooting for television? Well, um, I started out working for Gorman, and we were going really fast at sort of a TV pace, so I I wasn't daunted when I finally got into television, because television is faster 
Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the aesthetics has, have changed. It, it used to be when you shot for TV, there was a certain way. You used a lot of the close-ups and, uh, and the shots, uh, you know, you didn't hold them for very long. because And they were on big, they were on little, little screens. And now, of course, everybody's got a big screen. And movies and TV are a little bit more interchangeable aesthetically in terms of how you shoot them and how you cut them. Um, so, it, it, except for the fact that they don't pay you as much on TV uh, and you have to do it faster, uh, it, it's really pretty much the same. The good thing about TV is they, there's these residuals. You know, if you work for a network show, you get residuals every time they run the show for a while. And, that's, uh, that, and, and you could actually make a living doing that. Uh, whereas feature films come along much less often now. And uh, it seems to be a lot of feature film directors have now gone into television. Um, in 2007, you launched a website called Trailers from Hell. Mm -hmm. um, how did that come about, and what's the website all well, about? Well, because I was a because I was a trailer collector and a trailer maker, uh, I had amassed all these trailers for my, mostly horror films and science fiction films, and uh, I thought, you know, I got it's, it's a kind of a treasure trove. I wonder how I can get people to see these. I can't just keep them in the vault all the time. So I thought about putting them on the internet. And I thought, well, maybe that's kind of... Anybody can do that. What if I do a commentary or true two for one of these trailers and just talk about the movie? So I did that, and I put it up, and it stayed there for a little while, and some of my friends saw it and said, hey, you know, I have a couple of movies I'd like to talk about. And it sort of grew slowly uh, into what it is today, which is it's a site where I've got about 40 commentators, directors, writers, producers, can make up men, uh, all talking about movies that they like or the movies that they sometimes don't like. Um, and there's like 650 of these things up now. And it's what it really is, is it's sort of a mini film school. It's, it's just, it, it was originally developed for mobile phones. The, you know, the idea being, if you're sitting in the subway and you haven't got anything to do, you could put one of these things on and while away the time. And now we've got such a diverse bunch of movies and such a diverse bunch of commentators. Everybody from Guillermo del Toro to Eli Roth to uh, John Landis. And... Uh, it's a way of trying to point people toward movies that they might not know about. You know, when I was growing up, all, all these movies were on television all the time. And everybody knew about them. Now, today's generation is not exposed to these kind of pictures. They don't know who a lot of the actors are. They don't know who, who a lot of the directors are, certainly. And this is sort of an attempt to give back. I mean, to sort of point people up and say, you know, there's a lot of movies out there that you guys don't know about that you would really like if you knew it existed. And so you go on the site, you find some trailer titles, you press the button, you watch it for three minutes, and all of a sudden you go, you know, this looks pretty good. I, I'm going to go look for this. I'm going to put it on my Netflix list or whatever. Because now most people get their list from Netflix or whatever, and it's just got a lot of titles on it. It doesn't mean anything to them. Yeah. But if they can come connect them, you know, with a certain style of movie or a certain kind of filmmaker, uh, I think they'll find that there's a lot of movies that they really would love uh, that are, uh, frankly, better than a lot of stuff they see today. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, speaking of Netflix... You did a miniseries called uh, Splatter. Splatter, yes. What's that about? Well, that was my return to Roger Corman after working for major studios. Uh, the idea was that Netflix wanted to prove that they could stream things, and so they wanted to do a, uh, uh, a, a series where the audience at the end of the first episode would be, um, tell you who dies in the next episode. And so in order to do that, we had to shoot about ten episodes, and you're only uh, because there were five characters, and you had to figure out which one of these, what would happen if this character was killed, was killed in episode two. And then you'd have to follow that, with that, what would happen in episode three. So we shot ten episodes. Uh, they ran it with a contest, and people, you know, they chose, they voted for who would die in the next episode. Right. And so there are three episodes, I think, up on Netflix, but there's a whole bunch of them, to, you know, that, that could be put on DVD, and it could be like a party game. Where you know you can be at a party and everybody gets loaded and picks who they want to have die in the next episode, uh, and uh, I'm sure that's how it'll end up coming out. Is at the moment I'm not quite sure how you access it. I don't know if you could just maybe if you just type in splatter you could see it. Hey, you know. That's very interesting. Um, how do you think uh, modern technology has influenced uh, younger directors? As compared to when you were starting out? Well, you know, my, the technology was comparatively clunky when I started out, but it was still a lot easier than people who had to, you know, shoot films with uh, cameras you couldn't even see through and, and, and still somehow make great movies. <laughs> uh, today, uh, it's a lot easier. Anybody can make a movie. Um, if you've got a computer and a camera and some friends, uh, you can shoot it, you can cut it, you can score it. What you can't do is you can't figure out where to show it. And it's a big problem uh, is where you, you put it up on YouTube, no one will know it's there unless somehow somebody 
alerts people. I, I think what you have to do if you can actually manage to finish a film is to um, run it uh, at film festivals. And if you can run it at a film festival, get some attention, get somebody to write about it online, then maybe you can get somebody to see it. But the, the hard part is not getting your movie made now. The hard market part is getting people to see it. Yeah. Um, so you're in Madison. Give this a second. They're coming for me. So you're in Madison uh, this weekend. You did a screening at Gremlins on Friday nights, but you're here to s- kick off, uh, what is it, a three-week series? I did a, I, they asked me to select a bunch of movies that I thought people should see uh, that were uh-huh. that are pretty good. And so I said, they said, while you're here, would you introduce at least one of them? And I said, sure. And so we ended up, because it's daylight savings time, with a movie called The Big Clock. Uh, which is a uh, mystery picture with Ray Milland and Charles Lawton, uh, directed by John Farrell, who is a very underrated um, a director from uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and um, so I'm here to do that. Excellent. Now, is, was this something that was specific to the UW, or is this showing at other campuses? Uh, no, I think it's specific to here. Oh, I think this is like very good. Come well, one, come all. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're not really in Madison, so th- th- we could be anywhere. It's, 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 it's only the uh, only the sirens that prove that I'm in Madison. Uh, do you have any advice that you might put out there to uh, young and upcoming filmmakers? Uh, pretty much what we said. If you ha- if you can make a film, make it. Uh, nobody ever got to be a good director by not directing, said Howard Hawks one day. Uh, which is still true. Uh, and the trick is to be able to uh, practice your craft. And uh, if you have to go in the backyard with your little brother, t- to do it. You know, Because there's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things to unlearn. About making movies, and you, you know, if you got a, if you got the opportunity, uh, seize it. Excellent. Do you have any uh, projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to talk about? Not that I want to plug. I mean, I've, I'm always working on things. Sometimes they happen, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you work on them for years and they fall apart at the last minute, which has happened to me many times. And then they look on your resume and they go, "Oh, look, he didn't do anything between this year and that year. What is he in a rehab?" <laughs> and then you go, "No, it's just, I was working on a lot of stuff. It's just nobody got to see it." <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I want to thank you for joining us today because I know you've been really busy all weekend. The UW is keeping you busy. And yeah. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Um, are there any specific websites that people can go to to check out uh, current projects? What you got going on? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't have that. Uh, I, if I have a project, there usually is a website for it. But uh, no, I don't. Uh, Trailers from Hell is it? You want me? Got to go there. Trailers from Hell dot com. <laughs> yeah. Correct. All right. I want to thank you again, and uh, thanks for joining us on the show.